Welcome to FO Talks. With me is Eric Reeves. Eric is a trustee of the Darfur Bar Association, and his research focuses on the war and human rights situation in Sudan. Good morning, sir. It is a pleasure to have you. Good morning to you. Fair Observer last covered the ongoing civil war in Sudan in December 2023, when Martin Plout published with us. At that time, the Sudanese armed forces were on retreat before the rapid support forces led by General Mohamed Hamdan Dagalo, nicknamed Hamedi. Uh, how has the military situation developed since then? It's gotten much worse, um, in part because the rapid support forces, Hamedi's uh, militia, brutal militia force, has uh, made incursions into the center and southeast of um, Sudan, as well as seizing all five, uh, all four of the five capitals of the Darfur states. There are five of them. Uh, the only holdout is El Fasher in North Darfur, which I know particularly well uh, because I run a program just outside El Fasher in Zamzam IDP camp. Um, but Really, what we need to be talking about is not just the military situation, but the deep, deep insecurity created such that the convoys of humanitarian aid from Port Sudan that need to reach Darfur, as well as the Kordofan states, that's a thousand miles away, and it's not a secure route. And so the World Food Program is delivering no food. There's almost no food in Zamzam camp. Uh, uh, I provide what I can on a monthly basis, but uh, this is a, a small program feeding only the very most needy. Uh, right. Doctors Without Borders issued a report yesterday showing that uh, a, a staggering percentage of children are suffering from either severe acute malnutrition or are part of a larger global acute malnutrition population. Uh, mm -hmm. These are children, especially those six months to five years, who will die without therapeutic feeding. And there's there's no therapeutic feeding alone. So my emphasis in looking at the war is to look at the war's impact on humanitarian access. <laughs> I'd imagine uh, that the war has disrupted agricultural activity. And the last you know, for the last three seasons in Darfur, insecurity has prevented any real cultivation in most areas. Uh, and so this would normally be a time when the food was relatively abundant. Mm -hmm. uh, the next harvest won't begin till next uh, November, December. Uh, this is what's called the food gap or the hunger gap, uh, the lean season. And it's it's going to be brutal. Uh, we can't we can't forestall famine at this point. Um, every mm -hmm. expert I talk to agrees, uh, sometimes confidentially, but famine is on its way. The only question is whether we can mitigate it. Uh, and the evidence right now, as of yesterday from Doctors Without Borders, is that we're we're nowhere close to mitigating what will be a very serious famine. Given this famine, uh, people are fleeing hunger in Sudan. There are now 10 million internally displaced people within Sudan, uh, making Sudan something of a world capital for refugees. Uh, where are they fleeing? And what happens well, we to, to those who can't flee? Between, we need to distinguish between internally displaced persons, a huge, huge population, as you've indicated, but also mm -hmm. a refugee population uh, that now numbers over a million. Uh, mm -hmm. And these are people who fled to Chad, to Egypt, uh, to South Sudan. Um, and they are in countries that are not hospitable. Uh, uh, some make an overland route to Libya and try to get to Europe. Uh, but mm -hmm. the vast majority are in Chad, um, Egypt, uh, or South Sudan. The the refugees in South Sudan are in particularly bad condition. What 
what can be done? Uh, has the African Union been responding in inadequate way, or uh, are we simply seeing large numbers of these refugees being left to the mercy of nations that either can't or won't handle them? That's that's right. Um, the eastern um, part of Chad, which is where the Darfuri refugees are concentrated, has seen an enormous rise uh, in numbers. And the uh, UN agencies, international agencies, were struggling with the population before it exceeded mm -hmm. 500,000, which is what we're talking about now. That's a huge population in a very remote part of Africa. Uh, South Sudan is uh, in the process of becoming a failed state. Egypt uh, is not welcoming. Uh, some people have got out, but uh, through through to Egypt. Um, hmm. uh, Sudanese are, are not welcome in these countries. Uh, and so most of them are internally displaced. And uh, the food situation is not fantastic in Egypt either. I know that uh, all of Africa has been having problems importing grain. Um, a lot of the international supply lines have been disrupted by the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, now, nations that rely on Red Sea ports like Sudan are also experiencing disruption in supply lines due to the Houthi situation that has been uh, picking at shipping there. So the story is we're seeing things go from bad to worse uh, without too much hope, it sounds. Um, that is so, sadly. And the great irony is that Sudan could be the breadbasket for northern Africa. It has huge tracts of arable land, but the al-Bashir uh, military junta that came to power in uh, 1989 uh, systematically uh, uh, ran the agricultural sector into the ground. It's It's simply not functioning. Uh, allocation of resources has not been there. Uh, support for farmers has not been there. And then in places like Darfur, you have uh, Arab militias and the rapid support forces uh, profoundly disrupting uh, agricultural production. And you have a situation in which international food aid can't reach those who most need it. Um, so this is this is a perfect storm. This is when you get famines. It's an, uh, it's an ongoing tragedy in a nation of 45 million people, a nation that sits right on the Nile and that should have adequate resources and is undergoing a human-made tragedy. You know, and we, we see no signs that the, the, the key is to get food and medicine from Port Sudan on the Red Sea to uh, uh, Darfur in the far west and the three Kordofan states, north, uh, mm -hmm. north, south, and west. Uh, <clears throat> that's that's just not happening. If you look at a map of traffic on the key routes or humanitarian routes, there's no activity, uh, none. Um, and there are some uh, trickles of food coming from uh, long old caravan routes, some of it <clears throat> from Libya, but and some now some uh, cross border aid is coming from Eastern Chad to West Darfur state. But mm -hmm. uh, in the case of South Darfur, North Darfur, East Darfur, mm -hmm. there's, um, there's no access. Um, uh, and until we have a means of protecting uh, convoys, we will not see this change. Uh, it's important to remember that uh, nominally, the African Union has a rapid deployment force. Well, this hmm. deployment force was first used in um, 2008. Uh, 
and was a miserable failure. It was a combined AU-UN mission, and it failed spectacularly. It will go down in history as the, I would suggest, the greatest uh, UN peacekeeping history, uh, uh, greatest UN uh, peacekeeping failure in its history. Um, so the African Union is weirdly uh, welcoming Hameti, uh, this mm. man who was clearly a genocidaire. I've been following him for uh, well over a decade and have watched as his atrocity crimes have mounted. Um, and the fact that he has now been legitimated by the international community <clears throat> and made a key uh, interlocutor in any peace agreement ensures that that agreement will mean nothing. Um, so you have a failure of security. You have a failure of diplomacy. The UN will do nothing because the Security Council will not authorize anything. Um, <clears throat> regional alliances are quite split. The United Arab Emirates, and this is really important, I think, is supporting the rapid support forces and Hameti for its own narrow, narrowly perceived national self-interest. Um, but they are very active in keeping the rapid support forces uh, supplied and on the move. Um, Egypt is much more on the side of the Sudan armed forces, but it is in some ways a regional proxy war now. Um, and you have weak leaders like President Debbie in Chad, who are caught betwixt and between. Uh, he himself is a Gawa, one of the uh, non-Arab uh, African tribes in, in Darfur. Uh, he doesn't know which way to go. Libya is in chaos. The southeast corner of Libya, which abuts Darfur, is run by the brutal General Haftar, uh, a warlord, uh, nothing more really. Central African Republic is a failed state. Uh, South Sudan is in the process of becoming a failed state. Uh, you get to Ethiopia and Eritrea, and uh, you've got, in the case of Ethiopia, uh, a country that could be of help. Eritrea will be of no help. And Egypt uh, has its own problems and is not going to be a, a, big, a big help. Saudi Arabia is trying to convene um, uh, talks in Jeddah, but these have gone nowhere. Uh, nobody thinks that this has been at all pro productive. Could you uh, tell us a little bit more about the ethnic and historical factors that are going into the war? Uh, in the United States, Darfur is something of a household name because of the infamous war that went on there going back all the way to 2003. Um, could you tell us who was doing the fighting then and how did those factions and ethnic groups play into the war today? Well, we're talking about the same ethnic groups, the, um, uh, the non-Arab population. And let me stress that ethnicity is very complex and um, you have uh, marriages, intermingling tribes, you have the coalescence of people within urban settings, but in the villages, uh, and is primarily an agricultural region, you have non-Arab sedentary farmers, and you have nomadic pastoralists who are Arabic. The war was essentially between, and I can't even call it a war, it was a genocide. Uh, the fighting, the genocidal fighting, took the form of the regular military aiding so-called Janjaweed, devils on horseback, who would raid non-Arab villages, destroy food stocks, uh, poison water wells, uh, take everything of value, loot livestock. Um, and the conventional understanding is that, well, this was very bad, but it ended 2006, 2007, certainly but with the election of Obama. In fact, things got much worse under Obama for a, a variety of reasons. Um, but Darfur certainly was no longer a household name. Uh, nobody could tell you at the time in 2008 what was happening in Darfur. 
I think I could, but <laughs> most people could not. Um, and the years between 2013, when fighting really began a sharp uptick, and 2019, when there was a popular uprising, those are lost years. Um, there's a wonderful Human Rights Watch report about the Janjaweed, now called the new Janjaweed or the Rapid Support Forces. It's called mm -hmm. Men With No Mercy. And I wrote um, uh, a series of monographs uh, detailing in, with much data, much data mapping, uh, the activities of Hameti and the Rapid Support Forces. And this was as violent as anything we saw early on in, in the genocide. Mm -hmm. It did not go away, uh, but that that is the popular perception that this is a problem in the past. Right. Yes. When uh, phrasing that question, I had a degree of uncertainty as to whether to use the simple past tense or the present perfect tense, because historiographers might distinguish a war that began in 2003 and ended some years later. But in reality, the fighting that began then hasn't really ceased until now. That's right. Um, again, the rapid support forces led by Hamati were, when they were created, called the new Janjaweed. They were very <laughs> heavily, more heavily armed than uh, the regular Sudan armed forces. They were well paid, something that was the envy of uh, many uh, conscripts in the Sudan armed forces. And they were utterly ruthless. Um, and their mission was explicitly genocidal. Mm -hmm. Vice President Hasabo in 2015, addressing uh, a, a gathering of rapid support forces, and this has been documented by Human Rights Watch, encouraged encouraged these militia elements to annihilate all the insects in a particular part of um, Darfur where a... Uh, a massive attack was to take place. But we've seen what happens when people are referred to as insects. Uh, it was hard at the time not to hear exactly an echo of Rwanda um, uh, 20 years earlier. Uh, Is there a deliberate campaign or at least an intentional lack of effort to allay starvation in Darfur? No. Uh, Doctors Without Borders, which issued its terrifying report on malnutrition yesterday, um, is primarily a medical organization. It will provide some supplementary and uh, therapeutic feeding at some point, but it's not doing so now. The only food I know going into Zamzam, a camp of well over 400,000 human beings. Uh, the only food is the food that uh, I'm sending in through my very small project. Uh, mm. uh, there is food in the market in uh, El Fasher, some 15 miles away, and that's where the food for the camp is obtained. Uh, but uh, I'm reading more and more about children starving. I'm seeing severe acute malnutrition rates in certain population, child population groups of 15%. Well, most of the children who reach the stage of severe acute malnutrition, which is a fairly technical phrase actually in the humanitarian world, most of them will die without supplementary feeding. So mm -hmm. that we have 15% uh, uh, of the childhood cohort uh, that I'm talking about uh, severely, acutely malnourished, those, those are casualties. They, they may mm -hmm. live for a few days, uh, but they won't live long. And um, I believe it was the MSF report that said if we look six or eight months out, uh, it's, it's just staggeringly bad. Uh, what limited food resources there are now are already exhausted. Uh, people are starving. I read of individual people, mainly children, starving to death. Um, it's on us, and we have no meaningful response. The world is mm -hmm. watching, and it's doing nothing. Mm -hmm. 
So you um, you have been able to successfully get into the country, um, not nearly in the necessary quantities, some food. Uh, what does that look like concretely? How do you interact with the RSF or other forces? Well, we don't interact with the RSF or uh, the S El Fasho, which is where Zamzam IDP camp is located, just 15 miles to the southwest. Um, I began the project as a means of uh, providing assistance to women and girls who've been traumatized by the most extreme, brutal sexual violence. Um, um, with six women with some training in uh, human rights law, uh, treatment of sexual violence. Well, that was three and a half years ago, and now it's grown from six to 20 counselors. Uh, but these women also, and they're all women, and they run their own program. I, with a Darfuri colleague, uh, provide the resources um, and report out what they tell us. Uh, my friend Gatha Sanin uh, translates everything that comes from the camp. Uh, and monthly, these 20 counselors run assessments of this vast, vast population. Its footprint is, the footprint of the camp is enormous uh, because nothing's two stories, everything's one story. Um, the counselors acquire food in El Fasher. They transport mm -hmm. it back to uh, uh, Zamzan camp, and then they on the basis of assessment missions, distribute the food to the very most needy, those who are uh, extremely elderly, uh, those who are caring for orphans, uh, the disabled. Uh, it's a very long list, unfortunately, and not all can be served, but, but the people who are most vulnerable are the ones we're trying to target. We've also uh, rehabilitated seven water wells when the humanitarian aid groups left, um, they didn't leave in place hydrologists who could maintain these wells. So it's been very expensive to rehabilitate just seven wells, uh, but we've done so. And uh, the other great killer this over these next eight to nine months is going to be uh, unclean water, which mm -hmm. desperate people will drink if they have no other source of water. And this is, of course, going to produce massive amounts of disease. We're already seeing that. Um, right. Uh, uh, the water storage system, uh, traditional water storage system has been destroyed. Uh, we're, there are people there are really dependent upon these wells that were essentially abandoned by the humanitarian groups that when they left Zamzam. Um, it was a smaller camp then. Uh, it's grown steadily over the years. Um, but it's kind of shocking that uh, uh, a former English professor in Northampton, Massachusetts, is doing the only work on water and food in a camp in this remote location in Darfur. It is a blessing that you are able to do uh, even as much as you can but truly an atrocious situation. Uh, it, it's the greatest humanitarian crisis in the world today. And if you talk to people who, like Jan Eglund, who heads, heads the Norwegian Refugee Council, uh, uh, a humanitarian organization, I think very, very highly of, um, they will say this is the world's worst humanitarian crisis. You have, uh, what is it, 17 million, 18 million in, uh, in severe food, food insecurity situations. Uh, the humanitarian community is not servicing 15% of that population. Uh, you know, numbers only do so much, but the numbers we're seeing, the statistics we're seeing, the deaths we're seeing, the displacement, uh, of people, the uprooting of people by the rapid support forces ensures that this will continue, therefore will continue to claim the title and Sudan as a whole, the world's worst humanitarian crisis. 
With such uh, distressing numbers, the natural question would be, what can we do to help? Uh, what can the international community do to help, but also what can individuals uh, worldwide do? The international community has to figure out a way to get those convoys of food and medicine and other supplies from Port Sudan to Darfur and other locations in uh, Western Sudan that are not receiving any assistance at present. Um, uh, that's the number one priority. Uh, <clears throat> and at the moment, the international community just doesn't have any way of responding to that most acute need. Um, if folks are interested in supporting my present ongoing project, uh, go to um, uh, sudanreeves.org. That's my Sudan website. Uh, I produce a monthly update on uh, the situation in Zamzam in particular. But uh, one other thing to bear in mind here is that no journalists are going into Darfur. Uh, there is no human rights watch or human rights uh, reporting presence. Uh, I know what I know because I've got a lot of contacts uh, right. in the Darfuri diaspora uh, in Sudan. And having worked on Sudan for over 25 years now, you you get to know who knows what and, and who's trustworthy, who's not. Um, and you check, double check cross-check, uh, and I'm quite confident of uh, the information that I've given you and that uh, other humanitarians use when describing it as the worst crisis in the world. Well, we uh, thank you for helping to shine a light on such a woefully underserved situation. Um, this is a topic that the international media has a tendency to mention and then just as quickly forget. And you, um, you provide both valuable insight and valuable advocacy. So I thank you. <laughs> it's been my pleasure. It was uh, a pleasure to have you on. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Join the conversation at Fair Observer and subscribe to our YouTube channel.